good morning and as Mindy was saying my name is Karen McTiernan and I am currently um, a trainee clinical scholar at Newcastle University and NTW um, NHS Trust and I'm here today to share with you my research that I completed when I was um, undertaking my Masters in Psychological Science in University College Dublin with Dr Michael O'Connell and it is an interpretive phenomenological analysis exploring the lived experience of individuals dying from terminal cancer and from this point forward I'm going to refer to it as IPA. I'm very pleased to be with you all here today and um, so if we have a look then at an overview of today's presentation. So we'll have a look at the psychological theories and we'll um, consider critique of these and then we'll consider uh, cancer and receiving a terminal diagnosis and the experience of that. Then we'll move on to the method section, then the results, the discussion, and then there'll be time and space for reflections and for um, questions. So in considering um, psychological theories, a range of psychological constructs have been offered to explain the dying process. So Kubler-Ross postulated that dying individuals pass through the stages of denial, anger, bar uh, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Patterson's framework holds that with a terminal, terminal um, diagnosis, the living dying interval emerges with acute uh, crisis, chronic and terminal phases, whereas the CORES model considers the completion of tasks within the physical, psychological, spiritual and social domains. Okay, um, so it's interesting that Talwar, um, according to Talwar, um, personal death is beyond um, comprehension. Whilst as humans we can intellectually accept it, we can't actually feel it. Conversely, terror management theory holds that individuals are aware of their mortality and this induces a death anxiety which we all manage through cultural worldviews. And in the West it seems that uh, evading death has become the meaning of life as death anxiety is suppressed through various routines such as our professional identities, our engagement in leisure works and other aspects of our identities that we hold. Um, Kaltebaum contends that as humans we're not inherently anxious about death, rather we learn it through um, a process of socialisation. So it's just interesting I suppose for us all to think of, can you recall your own memories of the first time that you encountered someone who was dying and wh what that felt like for you? And I wonder if it's changed since you've been working within palliative care and if there, that ch there's been a change in that socialisation process. And I suppose I was talking to someone about this and they could recall that as a child, when they were seven or so, that uh, their, their grandmother had died and that they were taken to the funeral parlour and her mother had forced her hand onto the body of the corpse and she could still recall how cold the, the feeling of the body was and that was still linked to this day to her association of death. But it's interesting to note that within our society there's um, a greater emphasis now on there's a surge of debates around assisted suicide and also there's more people's stories coming through who are, who are who are living with dying and maybe this is suggesting that might maybe there might be changes within our society whereby people are becoming more comfortable by talking about death um, and it's also interesting to note that this researcher he undertook a, re a project and he asked uh, a group of students the question and i suppose it's interesting for us to also ask the question of ourselves do you want to live forever would you like to live forever and he found that the answer to this question was no so therefore um, that would suggest that dying isn't such an unnatural process for us as humans or to be able to think about it, it's not so fearful. In critiquing the models, um, it's been suggested that psychological frameworks have minimised dimensions of well-being and there's been a focus really on the fear of death rather than on the area of acceptance. It's also suggested that stage models, they undermined individual coping and they pathologise individuals who don't respond in a sequential um, manner. And furthermore, as I'm sure you're all aware, and you have a lot more experience in this than I would, but that people actually oscillate between the various types of emotion rather than being such a, a clear cut process. Um, however, the stage models are important in that they did legitimise the whole process of dying, and they also have given clinicians a framework to work from in order to help to understand the experience of people who are dying. With the exception of the core model, there's also been um, a, a neglect on considering the physical elements of dying. And interestingly, scholars query if we need a theory of dying or if it's actually more accurate that we'd have a theory that would be uh, based around the pro whole process to do with separation. Um, <coughs> and theories have also they've had a very broad focus rather than considering the individual experience of dying. 
Okay. So uh, now we will consider the perception of cancer within society. And within Western society, cancer is the most fear of all the illnesses, and it's also implicated in our lifestyle choices, such as smoking or the consumption of alcohol. And this means for someone who receives a diagnosis, there's a potential that they'll engage in personal blame for, um, for uh, the development of the disease. And um, this is really interesting because if you start to actually look at the newspapers and listen to the media, this is true. That public discourses, they construct cancer as a solvable problem and military metaphors are used to instruct patients to engage uh, in treatment. So words such as fighting and, and battling the cancer um, and trying to beat it are all the terminology which is used. Um, but I suppose it's important also to be mindful that positive thinking such as stay strong, keep fighting, um, uh, be positive, they can obstruct ex of, uh, expressions of grief or anger or if people want to start to plan for um, their deaths um, or if they want to engage in that process and I suppose that can really isolate someone when they're, um, they're excluded from the dominant um, public discourse um, at a time when they really need support. Uh, a terminal diagnosis. So with a terminal diagnosis, the uh, literature suggests that the individual becomes conscious of the notion of impending death. Um, this can cause psychological disruption, resulting in shock, which alters the whole person's sense of security. But also, um, relief can uh, prevail as a person's uh, complaint or um, the, the issue is validated. Um, uh, individuals become immersed in uncertainty and they shift from habitual, ordinary, everyday life to try and understanding, uh, understand and to import meaning onto the, onto the diagnosis. And this can involve reflecting on uh, one's identity, also lifestyle choices, and then also looking at the assumptions with regards to the future, with regards to relationships, and also with regards to how much control we think we have within the world. Um, and a life review can help to, uh, to re-establish temporal order in a person's life and, um, and meaning, but it can also reactivate unresolved issues within the person's life. Um, Iddy and McGregor uh, stipulate that individuals integrate diagnosis into their life perspective, whereas others contend that meaning reconstruction transforms the world view. Um, although it's possible that the person gains more maturity and insight as a result, of the experience and therefore their, rea their perception of their reality changes. So this brings the question of, with a diagnosis, does the person integrate the diagnosis into their life sto story? Does as a result of the, of the diagnosis their whole perspective of life changes? Or is it that the person becomes more mature, sees life differently because they've gained insight, but works to really integrate the diagnosis into the framework of life which has existed all of their life? So even though they feel like their framework has um, been shaping, does, does the person work hard to return to the framework that was always there in order to understand what's happened to them? <coughs> okay, so response to a terminal diagnosis. So our own research said that the ability to ascribe meaning to a changed world is more significant by the content by which that meaning is filled. So finding meaning when dying, it reduces suffering. And certain individuals rate their quality of life as higher after a diagnosis However, most individuals experience suffering and they grieve losses. And it's interesting to note that um, individuals that can report anxiety, the literature would suggest with regards to concern with leaving others. And I suppose this is important to be sensitive that this could be something that's unsaid within the room when someone is dying in that they could be under reporting pain or they could feel pressurised to engage in treatment and they might not disclose that to other people. Intense suffering ensues when dying undermines everything that is... Uh, meaningful for the individual and this this is different for everyone but it could include if someone values their physicality or if they fear that they're a burden to others or if they feel there's loss of control or roles or goals um, and this seems to intensify when the person cannot be how they want to be in the world even within a modified form. The demoralization syndrome arises when individuals experience feelings of hopelessness and meaningless and low self-esteem um, and it significantly correlates with a desire for a hastened death, but it's important to note that persistent hopelessness is not a normal feature of dying. So the literature suggests as well that external support, supports are very important for uh, individuals who are dying, and this includes access to psycho-oncology teams and palliative care professionals and access to treatment. And it's really important that um, physical pain is managed, which is imperative for maintaining quality of life 
but also it allows the possibility for a place to be created which enables personal reflection for the person um, and also for their existential concerns to be addressed. A range of interventions are utilised to relieve pain and it's interesting that Kearney uh, emphasises that to process pain, dying individuals have to shift from a cognitive understanding of their experience to really connecting with what it means to be dying and to connecting with their dying experience. And McSherry underscores that when individuals, when any of us engage with our inner process, it's the, the feeling of the illness, um, it becomes less overwhelming and we can feel we have more of a sense of control over it. The hospice uh, responds to the individual's holistic needs, which is pivotal to supporting quality of life. And as highlighted in the literature, a hospice ideal is one which the individual chooses and creates for themselves. So um, qualitative, so this study was, um, the qualitative research, it captures that there are varying perceptions of dying um, among individuals with a terminal illness. And the aim of the study was to explore how individuals with uh, terminal cancer made sense of their dying experience within an Irish context. So the interviews of eight participants with terminal cancer were analysed and the eight participants were Bill, Emer, John, Mary, Dune, Levina and Beverly. Participants ages ranged from 36 uh, years to 68 years and seven interviews were accessed from RTE programmes and one from the Irish Times. Six interviews were completed within a hospice or a residential uh, setting from 2006 to 2011 and the three participants were uh, interviewed on more than one occasion. Participants were residents of Ireland, they were receiving palliative care, they had the diagnosis of terminal cancer and they were aware of um, their diagnosis and they wished to engage in, in public interviews in order to share their dying experience. IPA was used to explore how the individuals made sense of their experience. Um, as a psychologist, I'm interested in the individual experience and this, this approach it privileges the perspective of the um, participant. Um, yet it also recognises that the researchers' conceptualisations are required in order to make sense of the person's personal world. Um, and it, it reports on um, the quality, elements of, of, high, of quality within the person's experience rather than looking at the frequency of how often the different themes occur uh, within the transcripts. Um, and so the data was analysed so in according with Smith and Osborne guidelines in that um, each transcript, uh, each interview was transcribed, then the, transcri the transcript was read um, on numerous um, occasions, um, then preliminary themes were identified, then themes were uh, clustered and interrelated and then they were shared across um, transcripts. So then this Then this grid um, highlights then the results of um, the analysis. Um, so as we can see, there are three themes that arose from the analysis. Um, the first theme was the personal impact of diagnosis. Um, and uh, this had four components to it. So first, the point of diagnosis was seen as a very uh, distinctive event. Um, then the second was within this theme, people asked the question, why me? And they tried to find reasons to uh, understand their diagnosis. Then people also engaged in comparisons and they experienced losses. And the second theme which arose was the struggle in adjusting to change. And this involved the coping strategies which um, the individuals drew upon. And these were both individual personal coping strategies and then external support. So individual coping includes drawing on, um, so, so the participants experienced a lot of emotional turmoil so trying to make sense of what was happening and they drew on their belief system as a way of managing that in, in coping. And they also focused on living and their roles and they set goals and they enjoyed life and they also expressed hope. Um, they managed unfinished business and they created a legacy and they also um, skillfully learned how to detach and reconnect with their bodies and they uh, also drew on family support. And if we consider external supports, which the participants highlighted, this included treatment, hospice support, society, and then the final master theme was understanding dying in context and to really understand the person's experience we have to look at it within 
the context of a person's life. So if we look at these, each of these in turn. So the first one is um, diagnosis. So diagnosis was captured as um, a distinct event which resulted in shock. Um, and this was captured by Lavina thus, if you had hit me in the face, it would have been easier. Each participant referred to the doctor in the third person, uh, which can assist in helping one to um, distance themselves psychologically from very um, heavy emotional content which has been relayed to, to the person. And we can also see in the accounts of the participants at times they refer to themselves in the third person as you, as if it's a, a protective um, me mechanism for themselves. Um, Mary explained how when she heard the word terminal, she sought information and said, he said, well, I have the information on me now, if you want to know. Why me? The participants all asked this question. This was a salient question. They searched for reasons for the cancer and they reflected on their identity. For instance, Emer described herself as a nurse and a good mother. Mary articulated there has to be a reason. She considered lifestyle choices. Nuala attributed uh, the illness to smoking, whereas Levina couldn't understand how she'd, how she'd acquired um, cancer as she thought to herself, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't understand how my liver could be in such a bad way. John didn't believe that there had to be a reason for why the cancer had occurred, and he asked, sure, why not me? Comparisons. The participants compared the diagnosis to past struggles, and interestingly, Bill explained, a terminal illness is not as bad as the depths of clinical depression. John reported improved well-being following diagnosis, which he attributed to physical pain management. Dune also described how prior to diagnosis she was emotionally numb and how following it she was more in contact with her feelings. Losses. Participants, all of the participants, they did report losses. For instance, Beverly explained how uh, the children, they want you to do things with them and you can't. John said goodbye to his home and he commented that that was a sad old moment. Future goals were also relinquished. Dune was unspeakably sad with the realisation that she wouldn't know her grandchildren, whereas Lavina and Emer, they had to relinquish their future travel plans with their husbands. <coughs> so looking at um, the theme of individual coping, um, the participants, it was clear from their accounts and it was articulated by Emer, that participants experienced a, myriad, a myriad of emotions and this could conflict with how they wanted to be and we can see the complexity of, of humans when we look at how they described uh, their experience in that. Lavina reported that she was determined to fight her, her cancer, but she was also reporting to be in denial. Beverly was also being in denial while she was also arranging her funeral. Uh, Bill expressed that he was happy, but later he expressed that there was a dent in the happiness of his experience. And John hoped for a miracle while he also reported that he was accepting death. Um, each participant extrapolated from their beliefs, and six participants drew on religious beliefs. Participants also utilised their own beliefs, and I suppose um, there are quite powerful cognitions which the, cl which the participants uh, reported. So in the depths of their experience, the cognitions which came to them that helped their coping included, for John, he believed that the, hil the illness is... sorry. He believed that the uh, healing is finally greater than the illness. Whereas Emer believed, we all have inner resources within us which we don't tap into every day, but when your back is against the wall, you do. Whereas Bill articulated that there has to be some assistance within our psyche which allows us out of this world. Importantly, the participants, and I suppose this was a key finding, was that the participants were focused on living and not dying. Captured by Dune, I'm living my life and not my death. Focusing on the present and being within the present current moment facilitated appreciation of what participants found meaningful. And for Bill, he recognised that this included music, whereas for Beverly, she acknowledged that um, she expressed gratitude that, I, as she said, I've been here to see my son go to school. The participants held multiple roles which they worked to maintain. Dune instructed her friends, don't treat me any differently. 
Emer continued with her parenting role and she highlighted, I don't know when this journey is going to end, but in the meantime, I think it's nice that parents write letters to their children. The participants set goals. Five of the participants organized new trips to spend time with others or for other meaningful reasons. And participants also uh, continued to enjoy life. Um, and Mary reported that she enjoyed laughing with her sister and John actively laughed as he recalled various stories. Each participant expressed hope, which manifested in many different forms. Levina hoped that God leaves me another 20 to 30 years, whereas Bill and Nula articulated how they hoped to die. And for Nula, she explained, if it means that sometimes in the middle of the night, on your own, as you must be, you are just about to go into the dark. That is what I want. Um, uh, the participants also, they highlighted the importance of finishing um, or engaging in trying to finish unfinished business. Three participants reported the need to say goodbye. And through counselling, Mary re resolved issues concerning her daughter. Three participants had unresolved issues that contributed to their suffering. So Lavina had a very hard death or a very hard dying process um, in that she just she recently had lost her father who was also in the care of the hospice and then she'd received her diagnosis as well. Um, and so she felt that she couldn't die as well because her family needed her. Um, Beverly too was worried about leaving her children. Three participants reached the point of having no unfinished <coughs> business. Dune declared, I've achieved everything in life that I wish to achieve. John explained, I've had a great run of life, I'm, 60, I'm 68 years of age, whereas Emer accepted death and she, has, she was able to get to the place where she transcended her ego and with the belief that her children, they'll be all right. She reports that my children, they'll be all right. Creating a legacy. In addition to completing the public interview, five participants reported creating other legacies. Emer prepared gifts for her children, she recorded a film and she also wrote a journal and these were activities which she reported were therapeutic. Beverly created memories with her children and she mindfully purchased a cemetery seat and Dune created a DVD for her children as a memoir of their childhood. Participants separated their identity from the cancer and also um, from their bodies. So John alluded to cancer of the liver whereas Dune considered once this cancer goes wild. Emer drew on the metaphor that the disease was galloping ahead. Reconnection with their bodies uh, facilitated the realisation of imminent death. Um, and Beverly reconsidered fighting as she thought, seriously, see me, I'm going downhill, so that's that. Family. Each participant highlighted the wish or support, for, um, desire for family support. Um, and I suppose um, something which arose within the analysis was for the, the participant who didn't have family support, the hospice became more important. But it was also very interesting that for the participant who had always held the role of being a breadwinner or that protective role within the family, the hospice was really important in maintaining that for the person. And I suppose as well, it's the art of when you're working uh, with in the family dynamic and how that, that changes as to um, how you support primary care givers and how you negotiate giving that support, but also um, ensuring not to be infringing on the support which the family are giving. So it's interesting, it was interesting to see that within the transcript. Treatment. Um, six participants discussed completing chemotherapy to fight the cancer. Um, and this could reflect the human uh, primitive instinct that we all have, which is to survive. <laughs> but within the accounts, there was differences in this, in that some of the participants, it seemed like a very long time ago since they had engaged with uh, chemotherapy, whereas other participants were very actively involved in uh, the treatment process. Lavina and John engaged in chemotherapy as they, could, they believed that a miracle could happen, whereas Nula rejected chemotherapy as she thought there is no chance of a, of a cure. Participants detailed the treatment side effects. Dune highlighted that there was fatigue. Lavina explained that you're like a, a pin cushion and that all the chemo it gets to you and Eva concurred that it all just gets in on you. Um, pain management, so hospice support. So pain management was salient to each participant. Bill considered pain as his one fear. 
and its control through hospice care was a great consolation. The hospice was drawn upon differently by each participant to meet their differing needs. Uh, for instance, Emer embraced hospice home help and that help assisted her with her symptoms, management of her symptoms, whereas Mary was more involved with the hospice um, and she explained how it's absolutely brilliant and uh, there's nothing else that gives you a reason to get up early. You have a chat, you come in, you have a chat, you have a cup of coffee and then you have your alternative therapy. And she also reported that the counsellors within the hospice setting were very effective in helping her to process uh, issues. Lavina highlighted the importance of the regular phone call which was made to her and how empowering it was when she would be asked um, nearly on a daily basis, is there anything I can do for you? And she emphasised that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. And she also highlighted the importance of the social worker in, work, in working with her children in that she didn't discuss the illness with her children but the social worker provided support for, with her, for her children. Six participants um, embarked on new endeavours, with three undertaking alternative therapy, and Dune completed um, a self-development course. Um, and I suppose that's interesting that even when dying, we can all um, embark on, on new activities. But also, I suppose there's this idea that sometimes people can spend a lot of money or organise going on trips or also organise shopping sprees. Um, and the hospice was viewed as empowering, it cared for a range of needs and unfortunately it, it in, improved quality of life. Um, with regards to society, this is interesting in that Irish society has noted that um, we are good at, at death and dying and that there's lots of rituals around funeral rituals which mightn't be um, based within other cultures. However, research by McCarthy would suggest that actually Irish people are not very comfortable with discussing the dying process. And the reports, the participants reported that there's a dearth of research, um, there's a dearth of uh, discourse within society with regards to terminal illness. Um, and Dune commented how acquaintances crossed the road to avoid talking with her. And Emer also emphasised that there was a lack of support within schools, as her young daughter would ask, um, will you put your wig on when you collect me from school today? Dune explained how wigs make other people feel comfortable whereas Nula commented that people feel frightened or they feel repulsed and that is why I went and I got a wig. Um, but despite this, participants, they continue to draw on artefacts of, of society and they continue to try and be linked within society. And John described dying as real end game now in the real Beckett sense, whereas Mary continued to listen to Pat Kenny on the radio. So each participant was living with uncertainty uh, ha captured by Beverly Duff, I don't know how long I have. <coughs> the length of illness, the length of time a person was with the illness facilitated coping. Emer revealed, I've had extra time because initially my diagnosis was two to three years. Conversely, Lavina was not in, uh, afforded any time in order to process her diagnosis because on, on diagnosis her doctor informed her, if you had come to me a year ago, I would have given you a year to live. Beverly disclosed, I put up a fight for so many years now, and this year there's no more fight left. Each participant's dying experience was unique, and they attributed their own meaning to it. Bill viewed it as another life struggle, and expected an average result for an average life. Emer perceived dying as, everyone has a life, a cross in life to bear, and maybe this is my cross. John viewed it as a transformation. Mary believed it would lead to an afterlife. Dune perceived um, dying as a quest. Nula lost quality of life and she used the time to say goodbye. But within that, she also undertook a very important um, public interview as well and opened up a lot of discourse around dying. Beverly fought dying and summoned characteristic inner strength and Lavina was unable to attribute meaning to the overall dying process. Yet she chose to fight it and thought, if God is going to take me, let him take me the way I am. So in considering the salient and the, the most important um, discussion points, or points of discussion, firstly, the participants really did capture and how they described uh, the dying process that um, diagnosis is a biographical uh, disruption which results in shock. 
However, interestingly, for individuals who had encountered adversity, diagnosis was less traumatic when compared to previous traumas which they had encountered. And hardship theory stipulates that individuals who um, ha have encountered hardship, they've developed the internal resources in order to help with the management of illness. And this raises an interesting question with regards to for anyone or any of us who have experienced significant mental health difficulties, does that then influence how one experiences the, the dying process? And there isn't a lot, there's no, I couldn't, there's no research as far as I'm aware on that. Um, also, the findings align with research uh, that terminal diagnosis initiates a life review, and participants did search hard to try and find a, a reason for the illness. In contrast to previous research, only one participant attributed the cancer to a lifestyle choice of smoking, and Lavina was unable to integrate the diagnosis into her life story. And as noted <coughs> by Murray, this can contribute to processing the diagnosis and also contributes to suffering. Participants drew on numerous methods of coping, and six participants drew on Catholicism, which, um, as Quinlan notes, it, this, the religion it influences how Irish people negotiate death. And Coyle contends that emotional turmoil is lessened when people develop a philosophical approach to dying. Um, it really came true um, in the transcripts and the participants' accounts that they're really focused on living and not dying. And this is congruent with other findings. And um, um, participants, they didn't describe new meaning to their life. The, the terminal diagnosis, it was, it was understood within the framework of life which had always existed and they strove to maintain their normal routines and they strove to, to maintain their, um, their identities and their roles and they perceived themselves foremost within the roles which they had always held throughout their life rather than assuming an identity of being a patient. And it's interesting to note that the two participants which had medical backgrounds chose to die at home. Each participant retained hope, so therefore, even when dying, the human capacity for hope remains. And completing um, unfinished business was indeed a salient, uh, a salient task. And three participants had unresolved family mm -hmm. issues which contributed to emotional suffering. And a key theme which emerged from the transcripts which I could access in the public domain was this idea of mothers uh, who had a terminal diagnosis and really that there was a sense that they ha felt the need that they had to maintain normal family life. Um, and I suppose this crystallizes cultural e expectations that mothers are central to the raising of children. But what does that mean for middle-aged mothers with young children perhaps, or mothers with children who feel they can't leave them? What's their experience of dying like? And um, what messages are also sent to um, the fathers in such circumstances with regards to their ability to cope for the children? Um, and to assume um, perhaps uh, a different role within the family and is, is there issues there with regards to mothers being able to express their, their experiences as well. Um, also um, participants created legacies that as found by Coyle were unique and encompassed um, um, personal values and as noted it is necessary to separate or to assist the person to separate their identity from their body in order <coughs> to help with the creation of um, a legacy. Later participants reconnected with their body and as noted by Kearney this did facilitate um, death acceptance, the acknowledgement of body um, decline. And the hospice was of a really important external resource and the use of um, alternative therapies seem to um, also enable a transition from where there was a focus on cure to where uh, the person could engage in a healing process. Within Irish society, um, there was reported a lack of discourse and education concerning dying. And this aligns with uh, Sudnow's concept of social death, where people can withdraw from people who, who are dying, um, which can be very painful for the person who is dying. However, I suppose there could be a connection with the person's own feeling with anxiety or their own belief in their own capacity to support the person with dying. And maybe it might be an idea to, to, to assist the person dying um, to assume psychological rank um, in managing such interactions. Despite though the social <coughs> losses, the participants did not withdraw from others and they drew on cultural artifacts and they purchased wigs in order to ease uh, social interactions. 
So professionals work to support individuals to choose to authentically choose how to die, and you're all the you're the experts in this area, and you you know more about the sustained emotional engagement and um, also aligning uh, all the resources necessary to facilitate that process. But the findings of this research suggest that aiding with unfinished business, facilitating life review, goal setting and facilitating um, comparisons, attending to the <coughs> person, supporting the person to remain um, in social roles and creating assisting in creation legacies um, can be effective interventions and can help to alleviate pain yet such interventions must be considered within context. And the findings underscore that dying cannot be understood in universal stage, the universal stages as it is a process which is influenced by the individual's context. And we as people, we are all unique as people. I think sometimes we like to, to, to believe or not, but we are all individual, unique, born at a particular time. We are, are, are with our own unique experiences. And I suppose within the dying process, we have um, our own internal and external resources available to us at any given time. And therefore, we all as people mark e our dying as our own unique experience. And it's an individual process. So just some reflections then on the research overall. Um, firstly, <coughs> that when I first embarked on undertaking this research, uh, I was met with a lot of blocks in that firstly I was asked if it was ethical to undertake the <coughs> research or to to wish to collect information regarding um, people who were dying and also with my colleagues um, when I was asked what research I was undertaking when I was told them that I was interested in dying that was also um, why would you be researching that or that's a very unusual topic to be interested in which also reflects more of the idea of discourse within society and the reality of that. A um, uh, second reflection would be that dying is not hopeless and um, for the participants they reach the psychological space where they are able to observe their lives and really to understand the process within the context of their life. But we could see with other participants they weren't able to fully integrate um, the process. So there's a huge variety across the transcripts uh, with regards to how far the person got uh, with regards to understanding the dying process or been able to reflect back on their whole life story um, and I suppose this captures really the art of clinical practice in that sometimes um, we can't always um, meet the person's needs or have all the in uh, external resources in place but I suppose it's about getting the person as far down the road as they, they need to go or that they can go uh, within any given moment in time um, and I suppose clinical work is a lot more complicated than um, I think the, the results really capture the complexity <coughs> of how complex uh, clinical work is. And then also when I was reading the literature there was a strong <coughs> theme that um, people die as they have lived and that how people respond to death uh, is based on uh, how they respond to other life struggles and the resources which they've de developed, the coping strategies they've developed in relation to that. But um, I wonder if it's more complicated than that and if um, people's perceptions of dying alter with changes within the context. So for instance with Levina, Levina had a lot of stressors placed on her at one particular time and would that have influenced how she responded to dying and if in if then therefore the, there weren't those contextual factors which you've experienced dying in a different way. So th I, th th I don't, th there's not a lot of understanding with regards to that idea. And then also, can we really research death? Um, terror management theory would say that we're all, uh, we, are, are all, all, we are all inherently anxious about death. Um, however, I suppose there's also this idea that we're all hardwired to survive. Um, and um, I suppose that Nulo Fuelan said, I think there's some wonderful rule of life that means we do not consider our own mortality. And I wonder if we have the capability, are we able to consider uh, dying um, and death? Is that, are human beings able to do that? Um, and I suppose there's the idea of 
perhaps um, when people receive a terminal diagnosis and they are dying, could they be actually more alive than other people within society who, who haven't um, who haven't got a terminal diagnosis in that there's a shift and that people become conscious and they become awake and they become aware of things which are really important to them or really meaningful to them, whereas other people within society um, may be immersed in their routines and everyday living that they, they're not maybe less conscious. So there's the idea of actually are people who are dying more conscious and more awake compared to other people. And I suppose um, m my final point is that from all my reading, um, I came to the conclusion that I think that um, we can intellectualise um, dying or death um, and we can have a conceptualisation in our imagination of what it is. But I think until the moment that we actually experience it with ourselves, I think the experience of it will probably be very different from how we imagine it's going to be. And that's, um, that's after all the reading and the hours, that's the conclusion that I came to for myself. Okay, thank you very much.